This is going to be shared with anyone who wasn't able to attend today's program. Uh, again, Selby said, my name is Paul Lindbergh, and I'm actually based in New York City uh, at Columbia University, and I work with all the European alumni clubs. It's really wonderful to partner with Yale um, and with the different CAA clubs in Italy um, and Greece as well. So I'll keep my real introductions extremely brief because we really want to hear from Alexandros um, Zeros, who's joining us today. So let, with a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today, um, Alexandros is a United Nations lawyer, and he's going to tell us about his experiences from conflict to post-conflict in Bosnia, DRC, and Sierra Leone, and how you can redefine negotiating skills on your sort of daily lives and how it will affect. Alexandros is a Yale graduate, um, and he also holds in international relations from Cambridge. I see we have some people from Cambridge today as well. And Alex D currently serves as the senior legal advisor for the United, United Nations peacekeeping mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, based in, Kin in Kinshasa. He held the same position at the UN peacekeeping force um, in the mission and based in, and Alexander, Alex D has previously employed at a variety of roles across international criminal tribunals. Um, I, if everyone could just make sure they keep themselves muted, I'll, I'll just make sure we're on that side. Um, and I wanna give the floor to Alexandro so he can give his introduction, his, his talk, and then followed by his talk, we'll have a Q and A portion. If anyone would like to add anything in the chat portions, we can get to those questions at the end, but just to respect out of everyone's time, I believe the talk will be about 25 minutes or so. so Thank you everyone for joining and I'm going to pass it over to Alexandros. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, good evening, Kalispera, um, and thank you all for joining. I'd like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, the Columbia and Yale clubs of Italy and Greece, and in particular, Andrea Mandel Martello, and especially Selby Biashimova, whose enthusiasm is uh, really refreshing to witness. And of course, all of you who've made the time to come and join me this evening. I hope to provide at least an interesting diversion, and uh, anything more than that will be a cherry on the cake. I, uh, I'm a lawyer, so you will not be surprised to hear that I'd like to underscore that my comments today are not uh, meant to represent any institution, uh, not MONUSCO, not the UN, not the ICTY, not the IRMCT, not any other alphabet soup of uh, institutions, but just myself. Um, the title of today's talk is Negotiating for Low and High Stakes, and I'm challenged to help you refine your negotiating skills for everyday life. Um, you will soon see that I define negotiation in a broad scope. Uh, and I think that makes for better stories anyway. And indeed on a fundamental level, I'm really convinced about the power of telling stories uh, from our own personal lives. Again and again, as maybe you'll see in some of these examples, I think that if we get beyond the pure bullet points or the, this is my position, and talk about ourselves as human beings, who we are, and try and introduce that element. We learn so much uh, from each other, so much more, and we can make a lot more progress in negotiations as well. And I'll also make one final caveat, you know, again, the lawyer in me. One of the books I most appreciated reading in my first year of law school was Patricia, Professor Patricia Williams from Columbia Law School's book, uh, Diary of a Law Professor, The Alchemy of Race and Rights, which on the very first page says, because subject position is everything in my analysis of the law, you deserve to know it's a very bad morning. Now, as a matter of fact, it's a very good evening here in Kinshasa, so uh, hello. Um, but more seriously, um, I recognize that when I tell my stories, I do so as a privileged, white, gay male, cis-identified, uh, who's working in very particular contexts with particular other people. And what my experience is, or what I see, 
isn't necessarily the whole truth or anything but. And so please take my stories and my insights so far as there are any as more of a, a very personal reflection rather than some great fundamental truth. And uh, again, this may be something you see in the points that I bring up. So um, uh, again, I, we'll have time to have questions at the end. I warn you that internet in Kinshasa, even at the UN compound is not always the most reliable of creatures. So please let me know if you suddenly can't hear me, it would not be the first time. Uh, but otherwise, maybe I think we'll take questions at the end. So uh, I'll uh, jump right in. So the first insight about negotiations that I've had from working in uh, conflict and post-conflict areas is that uh, just about the worst place to have negotiations is often the negotiating table. Uh, again and again, I have seen in negotiating rooms, conference rooms, whatever you want to call them, um, influence people into thinking they're on the stage of negotiation, speaking to an audience of uh, specialists in their particular point of view and stopping people from coming to mutual understanding and making progress. And a particular example of this uh, comes from my time when I was Deputy Chief of Staff to the President of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. As many of you will be aware, that tribunal uh, was created in the, uh, at the end, in the after, immediate aftermath of the Cold War to address uh, the horrific um, conflict that uh, destroyed the former Yugoslavia and which uh, led to massive atrocities and serious violations of international humanitarian law and the law, human rights law, uh, whatever kind of law you wanted to go. Most of it was violated at one point or another, I can say, after having worked there for a while. Um, and I was working as deputy chief of staff to the American judge in that tribunal, uh, a man for whom I did and still have enormous respect, uh, Judge Theodore Meron. And Judge Meron, uh, was a scholar at uh, NYU Law School um, and had written more than 10 books about subjects in international law, including at least two on Shakespeare and international humanitarian law. But perhaps most relevantly for my story, he had um, in his youth, when he was about 10, spent a number of years in concentration camp in Poland uh, where he had lost his mother, brother, and other relatives before emigrating to Israel and then going on to emigrate to the US. Um, this was a subject he spoke very little about and referred to primarily as the time when my education was interrupted and we knew not to ask too many questions. Um, I think that coming from that background gave Judge Meron the personal moral authority to insist on procedural justice in a way that I respected enormously. He would not sit by just because everyone knew that somebody was guilty. He would look at the facts presented, the individual criminal responsibility, and if he thought that was not established by the trial chamber, had no compunction in convincing a majority of the appeals chamber to overturn a judgment or reduce sentences. And as you can see, for a certain kind of audience of American trained lawyers, this seemed nothing but thrilling uh, and uh, the, the height of moral uh, authority. I think in the wider world, um, being somebody who um, acquits people everybody knows are guilty or uh, reducing sentences of people who did horrible things doesn't necessarily come across as, as understandable. And that's especially so for those who've been touched most intensely by the crimes that were judged by the ICTY, the victims. And uh, during my time as deputy chief of staff, one of the thorniest issues that I came across were the protests by an NGO that again, I have enormous respect for, the mothers of Srebrenica. Uh, and that was made up of mothers and other female relatives of the 8,000 Muslim boys and men who were genocidally massacred at Trebrenica by Serbian forces. 
And Mothers of Srebrenica, to no one's surprise, or um, I think to no one's criticism, believed that only life in prison was the right answer of any trial, and that uh, any outcome other than that, uh, acquittal or a lower sentence, was an insult to victims. And indeed, the head of Mothers of Trebrenica, in one of her first discussions, said, I line my mothers up every day and give them marching orders, and you, Judge Meron, should do the same with your judges. Mothers of Srebrenica obviously had a high media profile and uh, engaged in high attacks, calling for the president to resign because of quit. We invite them to the conference room of the ICTY to have a discussion there with the president, my boss, which I hoped would lead to mutual understanding and an end to this problem of these terrible press releases, which everybody was reading. And indeed, this turned into a disaster. As I uh, keenly felt when I went in, even though the only people in the conference room were the president, I think the vice president of the tribunal as well, and some staff members on one side of the table, and several representatives of mothers of Srebrenica on the other, it felt like there was a large invisible audience of which I made reference. On the one hand, law professors who would want to hear about procedural justice and individual criminal responsibility. And on the other hand, it felt that all the members of the Mothers of Srebrenica and their supporters were there. And it felt that we were speaking at cross purposes. Uh, the president spoke to my mind eloquently, I'd done some talking points about procedural justice with no reference to anything personal since that shouldn't come into it. The Mothers of Srebrenica talked about their suffering um, I believe there were pictures of uh, maybe even a piece of bone uh, brought in for emphasis. The president I knew was not a fan of talking about your victim status and did not talk about his own and reacted by getting even more firmly up, standing up straight and talking about how he could not order judges to do anything. This was a tribunal. There were voices raised I at one point had a tear on my eye and was told that I still had a heart and should stay that way by the president of Mothers of Srebrenica, which did not endear me to my boss, but that's a different story. Um, and they left and the press releases became worse. And that could in itself be the end of the story, how terrible a conference table can be, how great the gulf can be between the victims and um, rather sterile by design international institutions. But it's not actually the end of the story. Uh, some months later, it was the 20th anniversary of the ICTY. We organized a conference and with great efforts, uh, convinced the president to invite the mothers of Srebrenica. He also on his own initiative decided to visit some of the sites of memory and mourning of massacre and torture. And this was highly covered in the media, which I think probably helped um, pave the way. But he invited the president of the mothers to uh, a meal. And I was not present at the meal, uh, at this breaking of bread, but I believe the invisible audience was not present either. And I understand that at the time they shared some of their personal experiences, including some of the suffering the president had gone to himself uh, when he uh, had been a child and some of the understanding he had about it what, what it was to be, to be both a victim and to be related to people who died due to um, serious crimes, uh, grave crimes. And again, I don't, wasn't there, so cannot personally testify, but after that meeting, um, Munira, the head mother, told me that actually the president was not a bad man. She changed her mind. And they took pictures together. And it was one of the most moving things uh, that I've seen. It still brings tears to my eyes. Um, and I believe if we had not gotten onto the terrain, if we'd not gotten into ship breaking bread, sharing meals, we would never have reached this, maybe not a separate piece, but certainly a truce uh, between 
these individuals for whom I have, have still have so much respect. So again, going back to um, our everyday lives, the ostensible subject of today's uh, discussion, it is so frequent that conference tables or official discussions push us into kabuki theater. And it is so much better to share who we are as humans. Uh, it's something I very much recommend. Um, so avoid the negotiating table if you're doing negotiations. Uh, one insight from my experience. A second experience I'm going to share is maybe inappropriate for a lawyer, but I'll do it anyway. And it's from my time at MONUSCO, the United Nations Peacekeeping Mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo also by now a venerable international institution as the ICTY was, uh, began around 2000, uh, still going. Um, this particular mission uh, has as its primary mandate, the protection of civilians and includes a unique offensive mandate where we are mandated to conduct offensive operations to liquidate armed groups and thus uh, come under the scope of the law of war, uh, international humanitarian law. And uh, one of the most delicate subjects in international humanitarian law, as I have reason to know, having written uh, or drafted many uh, judgment drafts at the ICTY, is in the detention of individuals and their transfer. And for this reason, the United Nations takes very seriously when peacekeeping missions detain individuals and transfer them. And I, as legal advisor, am the detention focal point who has to coordinate any detentions that our forces undertake. And this particular story comes from around 2019 Christmas, when there were many officers in charge. And we suddenly received a um, mandat d'arrêt, an arrest mandate from DRC authorities about a particular armed group colonel who was found in one of our disarmament camps and was soon to be sent outside the DRC. And this person was charged with very serious crimes, murder, crimes against humanity and other matters, which um, DRC authorities were eager to discuss with them. However, because detaining an individual is so very sensitive, um, we had enormous problems. Um, the colonel um, was, had such a fearsome reputation that none of the mission translators wished to participate in any operation. And it was very clear he did not speak French or English. Um, the force, for its own reasons I will not go into, was not willing to support this particular um, detention. Um, and they were the ones with detention facilities. Uh, and so the suggestion was made that maybe we just couldn't do anything and would just need to move on. And this is where, as detention focal point, I suggested we move out of just what was allowed by our standard ways of doing things. Uh, and considering the big principles involved, find alternative ways of doing this. And I was supported in this by the acting head of Pillar, it was Christmas, uh, Cecilia. And so we, I recall that the secretary of the legal affairs section, not an official translator, also spoke Swahili and as it turned out, Kine Rwanda. And what I didn't know is that he had a taste for adventure. But when I discussed the problem with him, he said, I can translate for you. We reached out to the police component of the mission and they, even though they didn't have any troops or, or forces in Goma able to help us, were willing to airlift some people from Bukavu across Lake Kivu to assist. And, um, we had been presented with the rather intractable problem that doing any detention in this uh, disarmament camp, which was very open and might have catches of arms, could create a lot of problems. So Cecilia and I at some point volunteered that we could go in and invite the colonel for a discussion on the road, where we could then conduct the detention. And this was actually a terrible idea, which probably thankfully for everybody was uh, shot down eventually, but seriously discussed for an hour. Um, and we found a different way of um, suggesting that doing this, which was a daylight raid by our FPU at 6 p.m. That's formed police unit. So we flew in the formed police unit. My secretary, Gilbert and I 
went out to camp out with them outside the camp, uh, sleeping outside the cars. The formed police unit rushed in um, and uh, found the individual and dragged him out. Uh, we sort of covered Gilbert's face because he's a DRC citizen, so more vulnerable. And the uh, colonel claimed to not even speak Swahili, but could not, since he was speaking in Kenya, Rwanda, couldn't claim not to speak that either. And we conducted the pre-detention statement, went through the pre-detention interview and medical check, and um, checked with the ICRC, and then drove him in an APC straight to the military justice camp and turned him over rather than doing the more standard detention for a day or two in our facilities, since we had no proper detention facilities uh, available to us. And in this particular sense, coloring outside the lines and uh, discussing below and high stakes with different people than we normally would, we actually achieved a detention and a transfer that was approved by the ICRC and which did not cover the mission in shame, which so often happens uh, so much easier not to act than to act. Uh, and so again, I think when you're thinking about how to get something done, negotiation in its greater sense, what are we trying to achieve? Reaching out to parties that are not normally part of the process, coloring outside the lines, but within the principles, um, I think can often lead to more glory than sticking to the safe and tried and true methods. Uh, that most legal counsel would probably recommend. Um, moving quickly so I don't have my bar membership suspended, um, I will now move to the, to the last of the examples I'm going to give and the last pieces of advice. And this goes back to uh, a trip Professor Williams of Columbia uh, adage about subject position and goes back to the very first uh, job I had, my internship, in my first summer in law school, which was in Freetown at the special court for Sierra Leone in the outreach section. Some of you may remember that the civil war in Sierra Leone in the late 90s and 2000s was an atrocity uh, difficult to comprehend. The signature atrocity was chopping off people's hands, children, men, women. Uh, and certainly when I got there, you couldn't move around Freetown without seeing handless individuals handless children begging every time you ate a pizza at a restaurant. Um, also, a use of child soldiers at that time unknown practically, drugged, forced to attack their own families and villages, and with a purpose that may one day have existed, but it was very, was lost long at some point, to the point that the rebel United Forces' own purpose seemed to just be to conduct atrocities. But that's how it seemed to this at that time, rather young law student. Anyway, the international community tried a couple of new things, which was putting a tribunal in the country where the atrocities had taken place at the same time as a Truth and Reconciliation Commission was happening. And it was a tremendous time, the summer of 2003. There was this enormous hope that these different transitional justice institutions would work together and achieve something more than even at that time, the tired old ICTY and ICTR had achieved. And eventually the two institutions went to each other's throats and hated each other, and didn't work together. But at the time we didn't know it. And I was one of the first two interns along with my friend Atel uh, in the newly formed outreach section of the special court, whose purpose was to explain to the people of the country actually affected what the court was doing for them, a criticism of the ICTY and the ICTR. And I was working for another individual I respect so much, Ms. Binta Mansare, uh, a force of nature who went on to become registrar of the special court and who taught me so many things about justice as a very young law student. Um, my first assignment there was actually to work with a local artist to put together a book which described in pictures what the special court was doing the majority of Sierra Leone's population at the time was illiterate. And um, probably I should have known that this was the case, but I did not. And it turned out that concepts such as the scales of justice, blindfolded lady justice, or even innocent children in a conflict with too many child soldiers were not concepts that were going to go across in, um, when uh, illustrated. 
And it took a lot of work and a lot of dialogue, but we eventually got this book done. And it was tremendously helpful on one of my primary assignments, which was to go with the outreach teams to villages, talk about the special court, and with mobile battery operated televisions, show them images about what was actually going on in their country. Um, and as it turned out, I was terrible at this assignment. I was going as a representative of the court. I was trying so hard to get village elders as a representative to work with us to do things, and they just weren't. And I talked to some mentors in Freetown. You know, it's, you freak out a bit when you're a young lawyer and it's not working. Um, and they said, you know, Alexi, they explained a number of things uh, inter alia that almost all members of the village who were adult were members of secret societies, Sandy and Koro for men and women. And that basically, if you were not a member of these secret societies, you weren't really an adult. And that, you know, when village children were running away from me screaming Pumui, that in Mende, this meant white devil. Um, and so, you know, I wasn't coming across as the most charming chap you might have imagined. And the basic suggestion was to drop being a UN official and come across, think of myself as a spoiled and rather unpopular child member of the community asking for a favor from village elders, which was a very different position to make a request for than as a, what I hoped was respected member of the special court. Um, but as it turned out, thinking of myself as the spoiled child and spoiled and unpopular, uh, worked wonders. And when I made requests from that subject position, I got a lot more things done. And I'm not sure if it was actually that I was more respectful, more wheedling, uh, more pathetic, but in any event, it worked. And uh, I got my requests through and they were low level requests. but still very important to me at the time. And in discussing with people again, it was a, um, a real eye opener for me at the time the many ways in which what I saw and what was self-evident to me was so very different from what other people saw and was self-evident to them. And I adopt this when new staff members come or new UN volunteers come and work for me in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I explain to them that you may think of yourself as Blanche Henri, a, love, a lover of dance and of human rights, who wants to help the virtuous peacekeeping mission bring peace to the Congo. And I say, you may be that, but when you go into the police station to get to free our staff member who's been arrested on some allegation or other, you are not Blanche Henri, lover of human rights. You are a white or Western in any event person representing a peacekeeping mission that came to bring peace and is still trying to do that 20 years later and is the descendant of many foreign interventions that very fair observers would say had not necessarily always done the Congo much good. And if you come in realizing that not only are you that to start off with, but you're dealing with people who are often sick, have money troubles, have very many priorities, questions and concerns which where you're getting a UN staff member out of the jail is very low on the list of priorities. Your attitude can soon rise to the very top of their list of annoyances uh, at the flick of a hat. And coming in and realizing that you bear the weight of history on your shoulders, whether you like it or not, uh, may help you um, achieve your aims more uh, and take you having the humility to understand that you do not see everything and that what you see is very different will help you get what you need and what you want. Um, and uh, it's certainly something I think that everybody who comes into the DRC uh, is taught whether they want to or not. And uh, certainly a lesson I took in Sierra Leone back in 2003 and continue to learn in 2021 uh, in the peacekeeping mission in Kinshasa and the rest of the DRC. I'll stop here. I could probably, like many of you on hands, I could share a lot of stories, but they probably blend into one another. But I'd be very interested in hearing your questions, comments, or engaging in a discussion of this and other issues. And maybe I'll hand over to Paul at this time. 
So thank you, Alexi. That was a really wonderful um, three different um, parables. I think your final one really touched touched me because I think trying to understand the context of whatever location that you're in or whatever job you're doing is so important. So I think we have about 34 people who have joined today. Um, if anyone would like to raise their hand or ask a question, feel free to un unmute and ask a question or um, kind of go from there. We want to open it up to everyone to ask a question. And as people are thinking about those wonderful questions that you're thinking about, um, I have a question for you, Alexi. Um, oh, Alberto has a question. Alberto, would you like yes. to ask? Sure. Yes, um, thank you. It was uh, fascinating what you told us. And uh, I mean, there would be probably many things to ask, but one thing was uh, I, I was thinking all while you were speaking. I mean, since you had, the, as I saw from your CV, prior experience in the private, uh, sector and law firms and consulting firms uh, where you probably had experience of negotiating. But you know, one thing is to negotiate uh, in the private sector where it's a question of uh, business, money, um, result that you need to achieve for your clients. One thing uh, is, uh, uh, I suppose, negotiating in a harsh situation where the life of people may uh, depend on the result of your negotiation. Uh, it's probably like uh, operating uh, uh, you know, uh, for a doctor, probably after a while it may become uh, something you get adjusted to. But uh, I would like if you could elaborate a little bit on how was your approach to this and how different it was? How do you feel when you uh, realize that uh, um, lives may truly depend on the uh, result of the matter you are negotiating? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I'll make a couple of comments and I hope they at least somewhat answer because this could, this could indeed be a book of the answer to your question. Um, first of all, uh, I feel that my time at McKinsey and Cravath, honestly, McKinsey Moore, uh, was enormously helpful. It gave me so many skills that I was able to use in all sorts of ways, not least as an intern creating PowerPoint presentations for my boss. I was really valued for being able to do that, um, but uh, that was a minor point. Um, some of the skills are the same. One of the points that I used to do as a lawyer is I would just say what I actually thought the problem was. Here are my strong points. Here are my weaknesses. And these are what I think yours are. And I would do that when I was a lawyer in private practice. And I often find that this works here too, especially when we're working with commercial vendors. It's certainly uh, avoiding the kind of bizarre or kabuki future paradigm and moving into, well, I'm being honest, these are all the problems with us, it seems to work really well. It also works well if you're dealing with local authorities who have huge criticisms of you. Instead of saying, we're amazing as a peacekeeping mission, you should be thanking me for saving the Congo every day, saying, yeah, my colleagues, some of them are really problematic and really sorry, for example, that they're committing crimes. I'm here to combat impunity, but we need to do it through the process your country has established. I get a lot better reactions. But to go back to your point about what the goal is, it actually, when you're working for a very heavy organization like the UN, where reputation matters so much, I actually think that um, what I have to underscore, especially to my junior lawyers, is that sometimes it's all, even all lawyers operate with an ethical framework. But for the UN, it's even more important because of our reputation is what carries us, um, whatever reputation we have. Um, and so, for example, when you're negotiating for the release of a staff member who should not have been arrested unless a particular procedure was followed under our Privileges and Immunities uh, Court, I always underscore that it's so tempting to get focused on the release of the staff member, that that is the only measure of success 
and that you should do whatever you can to get him out, whether it's there's such a temptation since everybody else is paying even to use your own money to compensate the police officer for their time, which they always want, or to um, make uh, strong statements that uh, might not be held up about what the staff member did or didn't. And what I have to underscore to my younger colleagues is that the most important thing really for us is how we play the game. If you represent the UN correctly, set out what the legal status is, what our request is, and do so respectfully without screaming, never offer money, and clearly state that whilst we can't stop the staff member offering money, that is against the rules and it will be reported to the conduct and discipline team. That is when you have succeeded. And if you get the person out, that's a cherry on the cake, but that's not the major goal. The major goal is not to ruin our reputation by having been seen to bribe, bully, or insult in order to get our way. Because getting the staff member out, whilst it's terrible they're in jail for one day or two, or two more days more, even worse is for the UN to be seen to be abusing authority or managing impunity. And getting your idea around that, that winning the case is not the most important thing, but it's how you play the game, is not always something that's immediately clear to people who are coming from private sector, where clients really just want a result. Um, over. Thank you. Alexi, is there any other um, examples I th in when you were working with, I think, the Judge Murrow um, in the uh, former Yugoslavia, um, any other examples from, from that time? I, I thought that story was particularly interesting of how you, how you talked about the judge creating relationships. It would be interesting to hear. Well, <laughs> Judge Murrow was a particular, uh, was a very, very particular um, individual. And he had his own special ways of creating relationships with individuals. Um, another time that I, again, was, you know, if you're the deputy chief of staff, you're uh, often there as a troubleshooter. Um, and uh, you just have to deal with, with the problems that are, that are happening. And one of the very sensitive things that kept on happening was uh, when we would go to New York to discuss with um, different delegations in the Security Council, the renewal of the mandate of the tribunal and of the judges. And the Security Council had us on a very short leash. And uh, we had to, um, uh, you know, the Security Council would decide what to, what to do uh, to the tribunal in many cases. Um, and some members of the Security Council, depending on the judgments made, were more or less happy with the tribunal. And this is a matter of public record because they would make public statements to the uh, Security Council on the subject. So I'm not um, uh, revealing any secrets here. Um, and there, had, there were discussions with each member of the Security Council to answer their concerns. Um, and what uh, I found is that again, in these discussions, uh, sometimes they were set pieces. And again, what I noticed is that um, when we had discussions in particular uh, conference rooms of um, different uh, uh, diplomatic representations, special representatives to New York, often that was not where things were decided. By contrast, when we were in the delegates lounge, that's where they could find a way to find a problem. I remember there was one judgment I drafted that was particularly annoying for one security council power. And it was very funny that the quote unquote punishment, it wasn't framed as such, in the renewal resolution was a report that had to be made, a very long report on the actions of the tribunal. And there was a certain poetic justice in that the person who drafted the annoying judgment was also forced to draft the very long report that in some ways was penance for what was done. Uh, but that was a much better outcome than certain other ones that could have happened. So 
that's another funny story from my time as deputy chief of staff. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I know that you shared kind of in the sort of larger theme of what you're discussing, sort of negotiations. I know you kind of alluded to how you've work with staff so they can understand better to work within the environment that they're working in. Is there any other examples of something that really did not go well, like a kind of um, more of an example, and you don't have to name any names or anything like that, but an example of where was the antithesis of what you're talking about? Well, I can give you an example from myself, so I'll name the name of myself, um, a rather terrible example that happened. Uh, early in my tenure as senior legal advisor in both of these missions. Um, one of the many issues that you deal with is not just arrests and detentions, it's also land claims, um, where the mission is accused of illegally occupying land. And peacekeeping missions, it's a subject of books, are often accused of distorting economies by paying salaries and rents that are disproportionate, changing things. But so if you can get the peacekeeping to hire you or rent your property or compensate you for occupying, it's like a jackpot, so people really try. One particular person claimed the mission I was with was occupying, I don't know, some land he owned as a parking garage or something. And the person got really aggressive. He would call me at seven in the morning, somehow he'd gotten my number, scream at me, make threats, then sent a very, there's lawyers sent a very threatening message. So at one point I said, Mr., I'll just call him Mr. Annoying. Mr. Annoying, you cannot threaten me or the United Nations. We will not negotiate in such a situation. If you want to play nasty, we will, this is all in French, but you will play nasty, you'll play nasty as well. We can stop treating your dossier until after your death. So please stop, we will treat it with all the professionalism of the peacekeeping mission, and please do not threaten. Unbeknownst to me, the individual decided to record the conversation. I think because he thought I would ask for a bribe in order to do this, this is probably what, what he was planning. And when his call was eventually rejected, not only did he organize renter mobs to organize um, protests with signs saying respect private property and attack vehicles of our, um, of our staff members and injure police officers and others, he also decided that my comment had been a death threat and has been sending every two months um, letters to the Secretary General of the UN, the head of the peacekeeping mission and others, with many attacks on the mission, myself, and also this recording he illegally made with the title, Death Threat of Zeros. And this was one of the examples I thought about bringing, but didn't, uh, as an example of where you really should not let your emotions, in this case, frustration of being threatened and harassed at seven in the morning, get the better of you, because you never know what, when your snappy comment might be um, transmogrified and sent on a regular basis to the Secretary General of the UN's email account as death threat observers, over. Yes, I think people say anything you write digitally could be put on a billboard in Times Square, and if you're okay with that, um, that's how that's how it is. So I believe maybe and anything uh, you say on a phone conversation is required. That's true. That's true. Um, I want to open it up again. I know that we're we've gone about twenty minutes into the Q and A here. I know that Selby has some desire to possibly um, have more of a sort of networking opportunity after the Q&A proportion, but let's open it up for one final question and then we can thank Alexi for his time before we transition to the next section. Anyone else want to ask a question? Andrea. Alexi, talk to us about the effect on, on family of uh, developing such great negotiating skills. I believe my family may have logged into this, so um, they can probably keep me honest. Um, I, um, well, one accusation uh, that I have frequently been uh, uh, the subject of is that, quote unquote, you always think you are right. Um, and my answer is, well, why would I say something if I didn't say something was right? And I think the, uh, I've had discussions about it. Sometimes 
uh, especially if you're dealing with non-lawyers, and this is friends and family. Uh, if you are able to um, cleverly cut, discuss and present arguments so that you appear to be right and they appear to be wrong, and uh, it's not, it's, um, uh, and, and then you don't sort of, um, uh, you appear to have won the debate. It rarely leads to the other person feeling great. And um, one thing I have to continuously learn and remember is this point that I was making before, which is that it's not about winning the debate. Uh, I was the winner of the Panhellenic Forensic Tournament back in debate tournament back in 1995. And uh, what I have to remember with family and friends is it's all about the human interaction. And that the point is not to win the argument, but to maintain and build on the relationship. And I think I'm better at doing this now than when I was a teenager, but it's uh, probably still an uphill battle as uh, my mother and sister might uh, attest to. I think a good lesson um, is certainly the one that it's not about winning battles within a family. Maybe not even in general. Uh, I think as soon as you start thinking about it as a battle, probably everybody's already lost. Um, uh, and that maybe is, uh, <laughs> you have to unlearn your debating skills. I see a question from Marie uh, about the interventionist image of the UN and whether it's impeded peacekeeping uh, effectiveness. Um, I think that's, a, that's in the chat. Uh, I think that's a very big question. Um, very honestly, I think in the Congo, uh, at least, uh, the UN has a reputation of not intervening enough, that too many of our forces sit and sip tea and don't uh, go out and protect civilians. And indeed, there were many protests along that theme recently. So um, I wonder if that's the case. By contrast, I think the existence of military peacekeeping missions can impede the effectiveness of other parts of the UN, like humanitarian agencies. People talk about the UN on UN peacekeeping vehicles, UN is written in black, whereas in peacekeeping uh, sort of humanitarian uh, agencies like UNICEF write UN in blue. And this blue versus black um, conflict has been much discussed, sometimes overwrought, but certainly many agencies are wary of being associated with uh, what they consider to be a party to the conflict and a military operator. And they might say that our presence, whilst that we may protect them in some ways, the fact that we are an armed group harms their operations in others. And probably this could be a much bigger discussion, but these are certainly some of my reactions to your question. Thank you for those questions, Andre and Marie. Um, I think that we've had very kind of gone the gamut across many different locations and across many different topics from the private sector to the United Nations. And it's been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you, Alexi, for going through that. Um, I'd like to just let everyone know we'll be stopping the recording right now. Um, and we'll... Uh, the Alumni Association of Italy and Greece. I was really very grateful for uh, your support for setting this up and it was a very interesting opportunity. So thank you very much. Are a minefield effectively and B, uh, winning is, is not necessarily what you want all the time. And, and uh, whilst we, we deal more with the private sector rather than, than the uh, uh, situations you're in, I think uh, these are lessons nevertheless that, that uh, should encourage us to, to be a, a bit more open about alternative uh, scenarios and alternative solutions. And, and maybe uh, as, 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 as a very senior lawyer, Alberto might, might want to uh, share some thoughts. Any, any, any further, uh, Alberto?